Hello everyone, I'm your host Walt Shamel with the Aviation, Florida Aviation Network. We're broadcasting live from the aerospace discovery section of the Florida Air Museum at the Sun and Fun Complex in Lakeland, Florida. Our guest today is Jamie Jamison. Her job is manager of the museum Florida Air Museum. So Jamie, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So tell me a little bit about the history of aviation here. Uh, the history of aviation here, we kind of span a couple different topics. Uh, one of our most impressive collections is our innovations in propulsion exhibit. Um, I have the fortunate honor of working with Mr. Frank Klatt, an actual real life rocket scientist. Um, and he, he, you know, he's very good to me. I'm a history teacher. Uh, by trade and he'll, he'll explain all the propulsion to me and why each engine is significant or unique. Um, each one of the engines that we do have in that exhibit is either a first of its kind or did something groundbreaking to advance the different types of propulsion that are used in aircraft still uh, today. So you have a, a very good spread of history from the beginning to modern engines? Yes, we start from the beginning with, I believe, uh, Louis Blériot's Anzani engine that he used across the English Channel, and we go all the way up to um, my favorite engine, which is a little itty-bitty thing, the Ion engine that's currently being used by the Dawn spacecraft uh, as it travels throughout the, uh, the universe trying to collect more information. And speaking of collecting information, I understand that your family has an interesting aviation history. Yes, one of the reasons that drew me to uh, aerospace discovery was I have a long, uh, a long heritage of naval aviation in my family. Both my grandfathers uh, served in the Navy. One was a helo pilot, uh, the other was on a bomber, and he actually served in Pearl Harbor, not, not in December of that year, but he was there um, as part of his tour. And my father was part of Operation Desert Storm. He uh, is a navigator, or was a navigator for S3. Vikings, uh, my favorite airplane because the wings fold up and you can always hear it coming because it makes this whoop whoop noise as it comes through. Um, and then my little brother, he's on a submarine, but he also has his private pilot's license and he has a great joy and passion for flying as well. How in the world did your little brother get involved in submarines? Submarines, well, my little brother, uh, my little danger zone, I call him, he wants to be involved in the most exciting and the most dangerous thing he can find. Um, and he did uh, Naval ROTC with the University of Memphis. And when he graduated, he went off to officer candidate school, went to supply school, and they said, what would you like to do? And he said, I think I'll be in a submarine. And so now he's stationed as a supply officer in a submarine out in the Pacific. And he may be the only submariner with a private pilot license. He might be. I mean, <laughs> he's either got to be under the water or up high in the air. Apparently, the land is not good enough for him. I can understand that. <laughs> Museum studies. Museum Working studies. on a master's degree yes, and about sir. to get that. Yes, cross our fingers. On uh, May 9th, I'll be finishing up a master's degree in museum studies uh, through the University of Oklahoma. They've been... Uh, They've been great enough to establish a 100% online program uh, that I've been participating in. And part of that required me last August to do a service project with a museum. And so I emailed the Florida Air Museum. I said, hey, I'll do some free work if you got something for me to do. And I've been with them since August. I think you just hit the, the word for all the air shows. It takes hundreds of volunteers to make an air show work. And that favorite four-letter word, free. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. What inspired your career in museums? Well, like I said, my uh, family, very big into the Navy. We were stationed in Pensacola when I was in middle school. And one of our favorite things to do was to go and visit the Naval Aviation Museum out there in Pensacola. And you walk into the doors of that museum, and it's just, airplanes, history, more airplanes, um, and every time you go in, you know, I feel like you see something new each and every time, and that type of free choice learning environment that people come to because they want to know is truly a wonderful opportunity, and I wanted to be involved and be a part of that. There's a lot of history in aviation right here in the museum. 
I got to see the Spruce Goose when it was in Long Beach and go through that. Went through the Queen Mary that was parked right next to it at the time, and this was years ago. And I understand that you've been working with the Howard Hughes exhibit. Yes, sir. When I first got here in August, one of the things that Rob had me do was go through our Howard Hughes archives. We wanted to recatalog everything, and we wanted to document um, in photographs what we had, you know, to preserve it, posterity, that sort of thing. Um, and <laughs> when I first got here, everyone said, do you, do you know anything about Howard Hughes? And I said, ah, I know they made a movie about him with Leonardo DiCaprio in it. And they said, you should, you should read a little bit about him. He was an interesting man. And so as I've gone through the documents, um, I've also discovered that he was a very uh, purposeful man. That everything he did, he had a reason for it. You know, one of the documents I read, he was, he was going on and on and on about the windshield wipers on the aircraft, how they had to be this way and they had to accomplish this sort of thing. And I said, wow, that is detail. Because to me, I wouldn't think... I wouldn't think about the windshield wipers. I'd be worried about the engine and the wings, and you know, I guess I wouldn't have a very good aircraft if it was raining. But um, it's been awesome going through just that history and realizing the accomplishments that he provided and that he pursued for all of aviation um, is phenomenal. He was a very multi-talented person. Movies, a movie director. Yes. Uh, he even invented some dresses yes moved moved a lot of things forward in aviation mm -hmm. and I understand that you're trying to get the word out with some symposiums yes one of the things that we're uh, trying to bring back here at aerospace discovery is our symposium series where we bring some speakers in and they get an opportunity to interact with our constituents and our community uh, we had at the beginning of this year we had a gentleman come in and talk about spin dynamics and how to recover and what to do uh, should your aircraft get into a spin, which, you know, I had told my dad about it and symposium's going on and then I check my uh, phone afterwards, there's a text message that says, you know, Harrison Ford should have attended your spin dynamics session because that was the same day his plane went down on the golf field and I said, you know, if you can't help Han Solo, who can you help? Yeah, there you go. But we do have some other ones uh, lined up. We've had some great ones during the air show. Uh, phenomenal Jessica Cox coming out and talking about her experiences. We just finished one up um, about five minutes ago by retired Captain Kevin Miller on the Battle of Leyte Gulf, which I had no no previous experience of, and I was just sitting there like, wow, this happened, and it was it's phenomenal. Um, we're going to in June have a speaker from Pilots and Paws, which um, he's a he's a pilot. And he goes to these different animal shelters and he picks up animals that may or may not um, have very much time left and takes them to a different shelter to see if they can get adopted or to their forever home. So we're really looking forward to that. And then in September, we're trying to bring in Barrington Irving to come and speak about his experiences as the first uh, black American to fly solo around the world. Are you meeting some pilots with interesting history that you can get in your symposiums in the future? We are. Um, I've met with a couple over in our author's corner. Um, we had yesterday the SR-71 pilots, and then they're going to be back again today talking the Habus. I learned that that's their call sign, uh, talking about their experiences with that wonderful aircraft, the Blackbird, and I would love to have them back for a normal, um, normal day. It's funny to say normal day because when you're in the show, everything's cranked up 10 degrees, but, um, but have them come back and talk about their experiences. I'd really, really like to get involved with the FAA Wings program and be able to provide more opportunities in the museum um, for those those Wings opportunities for our pilots. Sure, uh, be very easy to get Wings credit for all those symposiums, and you have an FAA facility right here on the campus, and that's the uh, FAA's uh, safety center, and they do a lot of safety work nationwide. Yes. So with the symposium, you talked about two or three this year. Do you plan on expanding it to uh, more during the year? Definitely. Um, my understanding is the symposium series is something that they used to have, um, and for whatever reason, it kind of died off. So we're bringing it back. Um, we're starting off slow, as I learn kind of how to get out there, find people. I, um, I, I tried a couple of different astronauts to get them to come down here. 
and I don't think I'm going through the correct channels. So it's a very, it's a learning process for me, you know, who you contact, where you contact, and the air show has been a wonderful opportunity for me to just kind of write down names and, and introduce myself and say, hi, I'm Jamie, I'm the museum manager, I'd love to have you back. And a lot of people have been very receptive, you know, saying, hey, just shoot us an email, make sure you put sun and fun in there, and we'd love to come back. So we're working to expand it. Ideally, we'd like to have one a month, but it's definitely in a uh, growing process, a developmental process right now. Well, you mentioned an awful lot about pilots, and of course the mechanics say, well, don't forget us once in a while, because if it hadn't been for Charles Taylor, the Wright brothers mechanic, we probably wouldn't be flying today because the Wright brothers went to Charles and said, we want you to build an eight horsepower engine for our new airplane. And he didn't follow instructions. <laughs> now he built a 12 horsepower engine and as history has proven, it was just enough to barely get it get off the off ground, there. but it flew. Yeah. So. A, uh, maintenance history is quite interesting. And you mentioned this, the SR-71, unique airplane. If you can get a designer or a mechanic that worked on that airplane, particularly along with the pilot that flew it. That'd be very unique. That, that's a very interesting uh, play back and forth between those two. Because the SR-71, they only made a few of them. And they, because of a SALT agreement, with our government in Russia, we destroyed all of the molds. We can't build a new build one again. today. And yet that airplane was uh, better than Mach 3.5. And it flies up there. <clears throat> I think it's still partially classified. They used to say it would go up above 80,000 feet. I was talking to a pilot and he says, 120,000. <laughs> you know, yes. Right on the edge of space. <laughs> yes, yesterday they were uh, to kind of put it in perspective for uh, myself or other non-pilots in the crowd, they were talking about, you know, if you took off from Lakeland to go to Miami, you'd be there in five minutes. And I said, all right, that does really put it in perspective. And they, um, you know, it was kind of funny when they would talk about the mechanical properties, the pilots, they, they called it the realm of magic. They said, we make it go. The mechanics, they understand why it goes. And so it would definitely, I think you're right, uh, be interesting next year to maybe bring on a mechanic or uh, an operator from that from that crew and see what their perspective was. So leading into the summer, and this is the pilot's uh, spring break, pilot's as spring we go break. into summer, I understand that you have a summer family day planned. Yes, we're very excited. It's our first uh, annual, well, hopefully it will become annual, but it's our first fly into summer family day. And the idea is, you know, we're very unique in that we're located here in Lakeland, Florida, in Central Florida. We're close to UCF, we're close to USF, we're in easy access, and I think there's a lot of families out there that maybe haven't been exposed to the, to the aviation world. And, you know, one of the things that we keep discussing while we're here is that there is going to be quite a few uh, retiring pilots, mechanics, operators in the coming years, and we need young people to fill those gaps. So the goal of the museum is maybe to expose aviation and get it into some of the children's ideas about, you know, maybe this is what I want to do when we grow up. So we're going to invite them out here for a fun, safe family day where they can come and interact with our engine exhibit, with our uh, aerospace discovery exhibit, and some of our pilots and start talking about, you know, this is what, this is what we want to support. It's a family environment, but we have all these opportunities for your children to learn and become engaged in aer aerospace and aviation. Um, and it should be fun. That's the, other, that's the other end of it. We're going to try and have a bounce house and some characters out here for the kids to, you know, get to meet and greet and interact with. Is this a one day, a weekend activity? It is. It will be on Saturday, June the 13th, and it will be during normal museum hours from about uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. on that day. Do you have anything hands-on for them? Yes, we're going to have our stomp rockets, which I, back in October when we did Aerospace Discovery Week and I had no clue what a stomp rocket was, I was sitting here going, oh my goodness, the kids are going to be out there with like baking soda, trying to get, but it's really cool. It's just a liter bottle that they step on 
And as the air travels down the tube, it launches a little paper rocket in the air and the kids go crazy for it. You can see them, they'll find the ceiling and they'll be like, oh, I'll bet I'll hit the ceiling. And then I'll come around the corner and there's one stuck in the ceiling. I say, who did that? <laughs> but they get a big kick out of it. And so we'll have other activities, um, making some, uh, some moon sand, which is just a little goopy polymer activity that they get to play with and they like it. I can just see them going home that night and practicing with that stomp rocket. Yes, I, much to their parents' uh, uh, pleasure, right? <laughs> and somebody has to pick up all those pieces of paper later. Yes, not me. I have cats, not children, so. <laughs> Do you have anything planned for the fall? For the fall, that's when we're looking to bring Barrington Irving in. Um, we'd like to extend, expand our outreach to some of the community schools and boys and girls clubs. Uh, the goal is if we can get Barrington Irving in here to speak in, uh, I believe it is September, that we're going to try and bus in some students from the community, again, that haven't maybe interacted with aviation as a, uh, as a lifestyle or as a career choice, um, and then build off of that. So we'll have to see as it comes up a little closer what we can do. We'll definitely be providing support activities with it as well. What other exhibits do you have in here besides the Howard Hughes exhibit? All right, so besides Howard Hughes and the Innovations in Propulsion exhibit, we have a really great aerobatic exhibit. Um, over on our back wall here, we have some of the Thompson trophies on display. Uh, we have some Bob Hoover and Howard, uh, Howie O'Keefe memorabilia, um, and many, many home-built or experimental aircraft, uh, each one with its own unique history for why it was built, what were the modifications for it. You know, one of the volunteers and I have been desperately uh, trying to find out some more information on our uh, Whitman Tailwind that we have over here. Its propeller, and again, I'm going to preface this with I'm not an aviator, I'm not a, a physicist or anything, but its propeller has these little dimples on it. And supposedly the dimples were put in place to help with aerodynamics. But then around the propeller, I guess you would say the nose of the aircraft, right? Mm -hmm. Up there at the front, it has these little spokes. And we're having just the darndest time trying to figure out what those, those extra spokes were put in place for, if they accomplished anything, if they didn't. So if anybody out there has any information, feel free to email us. Um, we're desperate to find out a little more on it. So uh, when you got the airplane, you didn't get the books that uh, Whitman we had got, with it? Yeah, we got one uh, piece of paper on the donor, and that's, that's it. And we're not sure if he is still, um, he was a, a law professor, I believe, and a physicist. We're not sure if he's still um, alive or not. We've tried to contact him, but no information back. So that's definitely another thing that I've brought into the program is we're really going to hone in on our collections policy and um, change some of our documents and move them to digital so that we have access to them no matter where we are on the property. That's been a big thing that the museum is working on right now is moving more and more towards uh, digital archives. So it's a, it's a task and a half. You know, when, when we look at the Howard Hughes collection, that in itself is over 1,200 individual objects, documents, um, and it's, it's been fun going through and, and chronicling and cataloging them. That could be a lifelong job just to do that. It could, hopefully. Hopefully I've got, a, <laughs> I've got some job security here. But, you know, beyond that, when we start looking um, at some of our other exhibits, we have a really great um, timeline of some of the accomplishments unique to the state of Florida uh, regarding aviation. Our most recent one up there has been the addition of our own local state college, Polk State, beginning and developing their own aviation um, program and providing the opportunity for our CFA students across the way to, uh, to jump into college with some already dual enrollment credits. How many colleges are you working with now? How many colleges? We're working directly with uh, Polk State. We have the Travis Career Center, um, and those are our direct workings. I know that we have some uh, some cooperative, I guess you'd say, relationships. A lot of times I hear about University of North Dakota. I know that they have a big aerospace program. Um, and those are the ones that I, I know of that we're working with directly. Um, anytime we try to have an event out here, I try to get the University of Central Florida involved because they're my alma mater. Um, they have a nice big engineering program and it would, be, it would be great to see some of our bigger schools in the state, UCF, USF, FSU, UF, 
really be able to uh, become involved with this. You know, this past year we hosted the SAE Lockheed Martin um, UAS competition, and it was phenomenal to see schools from Michigan, from Brazil, from India come over with their unmanned vehicles, and I mean, the museum was packed with college students, and they were here for their, their competition, but they also got to, in, in, you know, partake in some of the history. And, um, you know, I know Rob Williams and I, it's our goal to bring more and more college students onto our property and, and get them to interact with our young people and with our older volunteers, because our volunteers have a great story to tell. Um, if you just sit down with any one of them, they, they have such a wealth of knowledge. Are you going to be able in the future to put an online course together where high school students could get credit for it? You know, I don't know if that's something that they have considered. Um, Mr. Iskra, John Iskra, our educator, that's definitely uh, something that he and I will probably discuss. Um, and it, that would be a wonderful opportunity to put together like a module of some sort. I do know that we met last month with a uh, representative from the Young Astronauts Program. And uh, she is very keenly interested in actually developing a Girl Scout badge that's based on aerospace and aviation to try and get more girls into the field. Um, I know that the Boy Scouts have a similar, maybe multiple, similar badge area, but there isn't anything for the Girl Scouts yet. So that's kind of on the horizon. One of our big goals right now is working with them and bringing more girls and women into the museum and into our workshops. I I see in the Boy Scouts in particular an interest in modernizing some of their merit badges and they have changed their aviation merit badge. It's going to be interesting to see what happens in the near future. Yes. Particularly with organizations like this one with Sun and Fun and the museum because there'd be more and more people working with the history as well as moving it forward. Who knows what's going to be in 10 or 15 years the way it's going right now. We may not even recognize the airplane. Yes. I almost hate to say it as a pilot, but the way cars are going, we'll probably just get in the airplane, push a button, and end up in Seattle. <laughs> of course, yeah. I wanted to go to San Francisco. <laughs> you can't always get Siri to listen to you, can you? <laughs> I know she doesn't listen to me, but, you know, and it's, it is. It's one of those things you worry that it's taking the adventure out of it. Um, and so I hope, I hope that that isn't 100% one, the case. I hope we still have some good sport pilots and aircraft out there that um, can come out and do our air shows and do wonderful acrobatic events for us. Um, but as a non-pilot, I mean, that's kind of appealing to me, just sit in there and go, let's go to Memphis plane. I'd like to visit my parents and just hop on. It's got to be better than, um, than trying to cram my overhead bag into the commercial flight. Have you been down to Sebring for the light sport? aviation program? I have not. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the benefits of actually starting to work at the museum is I've become very cognizant of the, the numerous air show opportunities we have in the state of Florida. Um, and as, as I finish up my first year here, I definitely am going to be developing a bucket, an air show bucket list, I guess you would say, of all the air shows that I want to see. I hear I have to go to Oshkosh. But now that I've seen Sun and Fun, I have to go to Oshkosh and see, you know, what that's what that's all about. Um, I'm told that it's just completely mind-blowing how many aircraft and how many people are there for that week-long event. Well, I'm not sure, being at Sun and Fun, if I should say this or not, but Oshkosh is about four times the size, land-wise. Yes. And they have a tremendous amount of aircraft there, and they have a Pioneer hangar, and they have a lot of history up there that they have moved in. And they've been able to move in some of the old buildings back in the 1910s, 1920s. Mm. We don't have the land mass. We don't have quite the ability to do that down here. But who knows what's going to happen in the future. The, the campus here has expanded. They've added several new buildings. They've got all kinds of youth programs going on in various buildings year-round. Yes, yes. One of the, the things that we've been working on leading up to the show was our new Florida Aviation uh, Historical Society Annex and our Aerospace Opportunities Building uh, directly behind us in the museum here. And it's been 
phenomenal. The Florida Aviation Historical Society group has moved in and they have some great memorabilia from the St. Petersburg Airline, um, from Tony Janis, and I think it's only going to benefit us to have them on property as well. And you're right, I'd like to see us expand and maybe um, be able to offer more and more workshops as we go through. You know, in the fall we have our Aerospace Discovery Weekend. And although it's not a giant fly-in like this, it provides a really great opportunity for educators and Boy Scout groups and Girl Scout groups to come on campus and go over to our Piedmont Center and now our Piedmont Aerospace um, opportunity over there in the 727 and really interact with uh, aviation-based concepts and ideas. And, you know, I, I really hope that we do. We can continue to keep expanding here. I noticed when I came here at the beginning of the month that they were repainting the uh, 727. And I didn't realize that it was a classroom. Yes, it's going to be really, uh, really, really amazing. What they've done is they've kind of split it in half. And the front half is going to be a classroom uh, and really cool for students. You know, when you get on a plane, if you've ever been on a plane before, you, you're expecting those nice aircraft chairs with the high back. So the student group has been working, the Future Eagles has been working to refurbish some old donated chairs. And they're actually gonna sit in those airplane chairs and they're gonna have their little fold out table for a desk and we're going to have um, a lot of technology in there too. We're going to have a projection system and a projector and a little uh, PA or announcing system. And then the second half is going to be a fantastic conference room. They're going to have space in there where you can sit, you can meet. We're going to have digital capabilities with televisions where you can either play a PowerPoint for a conference or if you have a video. Um, and I think it's, it's definitely one of a kind and it's going to bring um, a lot of a lot of people into the area that maybe haven't been out here yet just to see it and interact with it. So uh, if I go into the aircraft and take one of the seats, will I get peanuts? Will you get peanuts? I don't know. We'll have to ask Rob. We'll put a little flight attendant hat on him and let him hand out peanuts and soda. It was it was funny. Uh, two days ago, he was trying to show me how to close the aircraft door, and you know he just. He does it, it's almost like rope memory, and I'm there dangling from it, trying to get it to close shut. And he goes, you got to put your back into it. And I'm like, I am. <laughs> yeah, it, it takes a little bit to get that door to slam against the seal. Yes, and that was the hard, I'm like, Shh, trying to wrench it down. And then he goes, well, this is how you arm the slide and disarm the slide. I'm like, there's an actual slide on this? You didn't tell me that. And he said, no, there isn't. But he was showing me just in case I'm ever in the opportunity. Um, and it's great. I mean, I've watched that aircraft since I got here in August be completely transformed. You know, FedEx was more than generous enough to donate it, and we've been allowed to do what we want to do to make it a truly educational experience. Have you had the opportunity to run the back stairs up and down? <laughs> I, I have not yet. Um, I've watched it happen, and I've told Rob, you know, oh, I think my shoulder's a little sore today. I don't know if I can get that hydraulic pump going. Um, but it's phenomenal. I didn't think they'd work without it turned on. I said, you're going to bring the stairs down without the engines and the power on? And he goes, yeah. And I, and I looked at him. I grew up in Italy for a few years. And at the airports in Italy, that's how they all embark and disembark. Most of the time is through the tail. And so, you know, I was like, this is taking me back. And he goes, well, you can try it. And I said, I'm okay. <laughs> I just, I don't want to pull something. I've got all these archives to go through next week. I see the stairs are down for the tourist uh, yes. visitors going through to, uh, the uh, facility. Well, you've got a lot of work ahead of you. Yes, a lot of great work, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So when you get this all digitized, and you're about 942. <laughs> In a day. <laughs> you're going to be the uh, museum director before long? I don't know. That is, that's definitely the goal. Um, presently, you know, I'm enjoying working with the volunteers and I'm enjoying working with the community. You know, uh, sometimes I envy Rob. He gets to go and do the cool things, uh, but sometimes he has to handle the business aspect and, and I'm not a very good business person, so we'll have to see. I would really love uh, to find a place in the education areas. I taught high school for seven years and so that's you know, history and, and working with students is truly my passion. Um, so we'll have to see, maybe maybe out of the, the archives, I can develop a unique uh, Howard Hughes program to complement uh, the exhibit over there and talk a little more about his accomplishments and his, his inventions. I 
can't remember, but I think it was the mayor of St. Petersburg that made the first seaplane flight from St. Petersburg over to Tampa. Yes, I believe there was an auction and somehow he ended up being the winning bid. <laughs> that must have been quite an achievement because I saw a picture of the airplane. It looked like a canoe with wings. Yes, it did. We actually have in our uh, Pioneers exhibit over there, we have one of the, the first uh, it's a replica of an advertisement for the flight. And I looked at it and I said, so it's just you and the pilot, huh? And there's no, there's no cabin, so you gotta hold on to your hats and be ready to go. Um, but it does, it looks, it looks like, you know, it was a great accomplishment and kind of going on what you said earlier, it makes you wonder, what's next? What's next? Who's going to be the first person on the cusp of, you know, reducing the amount of time it takes to get between here and, and London or here in Guam where my little brother lives? I'd like to go visit him, but I said, it's about a 20 something hour uh, trip, little brother. I'll have to meet you in Hawaii. How about halfway? Um, but it, it should be interesting to see how commercial airlines develop uh, as we go on and how private um, and sport pilot aircraft change and you know where some of these aircraft will, will be side by side with some of those new aircraft in our museum. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what, what comes down the pipeline. Well if you go to Guam and you come back home you can be here before you took off from Guam. Yes, yes, I'm crossing the international date line and getting all sorts of confused and going, what day is it? <laughs> <laughs> that was a lesson I used to teach geography and that was my ninth graders and I would sit there and you'd think that it was like the deadline at a newspaper meeting, we're all sweating and moving our head and I'm like, okay, when you cross the date line this way, you, you gain a day and you cross it this way, you lose a day and they would just be like, ah. So we had to get the globe out and I'd get a little airplane go back and forth and they'd look at me like I was crazy playing with toys in my room but by the end of it most of them got it. <laughs> the International Dateline goes between two islands Yes, in they, the Bering uh, Sea. Yeah. Little Diomede and Big Diomede. Great names. And on one side is Russia and on our side is the United States. And in the winter the ocean freezes and they walk back and forth without benefit of passport. <laughs> Just I'm on this side, now I'm on that side. I'm on this side, now I'm on that side. So with the family history of aviation that you've got and your interest in the museum, this is going to be real interesting to see what happens in the near future. Yes. And Jamie, thank you very much. Yes, We're glad you. you could be with us to help celebrate the 41st annual fly-in and symposium with Sun and Fun. You're welcome. And thank you for joining the Florida Aviation Network, and we'll see you the next time.